All right, hey folks, Faz here from Faz Lifts. Today we've got a video about training hard. This is such a difficult topic to talk about and convey accurately over the internet and, and over YouTube because there are so many problems with the approach, with how to explain things. So much ego, interpretation, subjectivity, and uh, as a guy who works with people and also does this YouTube thing now, I can see there's this beyond any other measure of training um, parameters, like, for example, volume or frequency. Intensity is the one parameter that causes the most amount of problems. And I fully believe it's down to ego. I think ego gets in the way. And as a result, people just can't look at things objectively. But that's what we're going to talk about today. So firstly, thanks for making it onto my channel. If you have any questions or comments, pop them down below. And if you'd like to work with me on your own strength and physique goals, there's a link in the description. All right, so um, let's get started on this. So I want to discuss what I call the fatigue performance drop-off. So to begin, I think most people, even high-level lifters, would argue that they train hard. Now, you can take this right back to the uh, early sort of 90s and the training videos that I used to see coming out from, say, Flex Wheeler, um, Lee Labrador, Sean Ray, um, Chris Cormier, all those kind of videos where they would train, they would all think they're training hard, even back in the Arnold days. But really, none of them trained to failure or anything close to failure. They just kind of like lifted, 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 and wham, that's it. And I remember a video of um, Flex Wheeler doing pull ups with Charles Glass. He does pull-ups, he does the pull-ups, and then he just kind of stops. <laughs> and he sits down, breathes heavy, looks really like pensive and dramatic. <laughs> and um, he does it again. It's just, there's no real anything close to failure. The only the only training videos where I really saw people training to failure were Dorian Yates, and they completely turned the world upside down. You know, he had that whole era of mystique going on. But then if you fast forward to Jay Cutler, even Ronnie Coleman, I mean... Yeah, there wasn't any training to failure. But if you ask them all, apart from Jay, because Jay's been very vocal about this, did you train to failure? Most of them say, yeah, they probably did. They're, at least they train very hard. But if you look at them train, they just do a few things and then they kind of stop, right? Even up until the modern day. And if you look at um, the Mike Isretel, Jared Feather crew, um, love those guys, really like the content. But, you know, truth be told, if you look at what they, how they train, very little of what they do, it could be argued, is training to the type of failure that Dorian Yates did, right? So notice my wording there, the type of failure. So essentially, there are problems with definition of what failure is. So it's very subjective. So most people would argue they train hard. That is, they either train to failure or maybe like one or two reps away from failure, okay? The problem with that is it's highly subjective. And I've just listed off a bunch of examples. And I think the big issue with it is involves ego. I mean, you all saw Lyle's, sorry, um, Mike's reply to Lyle, and he didn't really tackle Lyle's problems. And by the way, if you want some clarification on that, go watch GVS's video on that from about a year ago, Jeffrey Verity Schofield. He did a really good video detailing that whole drama, and basically Lyle accused them of not trained to failure. Mike kind of got a bit childish and, and just said, just flipped him off in the middle of a training session or something weird like that, which is a bit odd, a bit disappointing. But in any case, it shows the subjective nature of things and it shows how much ego gets involved in these things. Ego and bravado come into play when it comes to intensity to a much greater extent than volume and frequency. Like nobody hangs their hat on and goes, well, I train my muscles six days a week. How, how often do you train them? Twice? <laughs> Wuss. Like, no, no, we don't get those kind of conversations. Or if we say to somebody, hey, you're only training one time a week, maybe you should train two times. And they'll be like, well, no, I don't want to because once works better for me. No one really talks about things in that way, okay? When it comes to like volume as well, there's not much of that. There's a bit more of that, but there's not much of that. When it comes to intensity, everybody's got something to say. Everybody wants to defend their standpoint. Everybody wants to just hold on to whatever dogma they've got. And that means we lose out on the benefits of exploring what different intensities actually involve and bring to the table, but also it makes communication hell. So I would like to have this video without any kind of drama or without a lot of big egos. I can safely say I've made a few videos on RIR so far, 
and they've all involved at least some five to ten percent of ego in the comments and not not i think most people get what i'm trying to say and they understand but i think there's there's still a good portion of people which probably represents more who are maybe listening who just think no whenever they hear the words like rir or reps in reserve they go no no I train to failure. I don't want to hear anything else. Or I train one rep away from failure. And they truly believe that. So I think, I think you know, people kind of shut themselves off. And as soon as you have such a strong visceral reaction to something that somebody's saying to you, you should probably explore that and think, why am I reacting so negatively to what this guy's saying? He's just trying to help. Maybe I should think about it. Anyway, so we can begin to do this <laughs> define intensity with RAR. However, it's also clear from the past you know, week or so that people equate the words RIR with going too easy automatically. People have a very visceral reaction against RIR because they just don't want to hear that. They immediately say, no, I don't like RIR. I don't like reps in reserve. And they'll kind of like reverse engineer that and backwards backpedal and go, it's, I say that because most people don't train hard enough. So it, I just tell them to train as hard as they can. And then they still, you know, fall short and that's better. I don't know how accurate that is. I think if we just give people a better definition, then they're probably more likely to do it better, right? That's that's the way I operate. So you can tell people to work as hard as they possibly can. And then if they fall short, you can blame them. But why don't we just define more clearly what hard work actually is? And that's kind of what I want to do in this video. It's been a very long intro, but I'm kind of setting you, you guys up for this, for this point here, talking you through my thought process. So yeah, I think people equate RAR with going too easy. And also people are notoriously bad at targeting failure and reps away from failure. So we know that. The guy the guy in the gym who says, yeah, he takes everything to failure, has, hasn't has seen failure since, you know, for, that, for, for years, so since he's trained. I remember training him with a couple of lads and they asked me to help them with their training just you know at the gym just took 10 minutes and uh, they were all going seven reps away from failure <laughs> every time I shouted at them to do more they did more and it ended up doing seven more reps after they thought they'd failed and I, th I think most people train in that way so in my experience both of these things like either the ego thing or you know just not being able to gauge RAR it's mostly down to user error and ego and they can be improved on so we can offer people education on that's kind of what I'm trying to do. So what we need is we need another metric to show people um, and give people an individual insight into set performance and hopefully open their eyes to think, okay, whoa, maybe I need to take this seriously. Maybe it's what Faz is saying does apply to me. So this is what I term uh, performance fatigue drop-off. So let's say you're hitting a bench press. I'm just going to make it a bit bigger so you guys can see. Okay, so this is what your bench press sets look like. You go eight, 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 six. All right, it's your bench press. Now, that for you represents hard work. You've rested two or three minutes between sets. You're like, I, had, I put in some good work there. Okay. I would look at that and think there are clues here as to why this person is not training as hard as they think they are. So, and it's on a postcard. What are those things? Firstly, if we just go through the sets, set one was not fatigue enough inducing to cause a performance drop off for set two. So basically it wasn't hard enough to cause any kind of performance detriment in set two. And set two wasn't hard enough to cause any kind of performance drop off in set three, which meant that by set four, we finally got a rep drop. Okay. So we got down to six reps. So did we cause enough fatigue at that stage to cause a rep drop off or well you could say of course we did but maybe maybe you just got bored maybe you just got tired so we can't say realistically that if the first and second sets and third sets didn't induce enough of a performance decrease to actually lose subsequent reps on the next set if we can't say that happened, and in this case we can't, then we also can't realistically say that the sets were stimulating enough. That's kind of my point with this whole thing. If we did a set of eight and eight, and we still got a third set of eight, those first two sets were clearly not very stimulating at all. 
because they just didn't produce much fatigue because training always produces a certain level of fatigue. Now, if we've done three sets and they're all the same reps, we can't then turn around and make a strong argument to say those were working sets. We can't. Even though the weight is close to our what we normally use for eights, it doesn't matter. It didn't cause a it didn't cause sufficient fatigue to prevent performance in the next set. So we can't sit back and go, fine, we did a working set there. It wasn't enough to stimulate any fatigue or enough fatigue to warrant a drop off. So we can't really say it was stimulating enough to actually give us a growth stimulus. That's my first sort of argument about using this as a clue for what your working sets should look like. So we're not just looking to get tired. At the end of a session, you might do less because simply you're tired. It doesn't mean you've stimulated growth. We're aiming at sets to be stimulative. We don't just want to be tired. If we're not seeing a performance drop off, we can't realistically say we created a lot of fatigue. And if we're not creating a lot of fatigue, I don't think we can realistically say we're performing stimulative sets. We might just be in there getting tired. Now, your retort to that might be, well, Faz, actually, you know, I take a lot of rest between sets. I take three, four, five minutes. That's a possibility. So maybe. It's maybe a possibility. Okay. Some of you will think that, okay, I just take a lot of rest between sets. Now, it's possible, but I would say it's still unlikely. Even with decent rest, like up to, say, three minutes, you're unlikely to repeat the same performance again within a few minutes if it was a truly stimulative set. It's unlikely from what I've experienced. For those also, those people who do rest a long time, um, my sort of question is, what are you doing in that time in the gym? So let's say you rest three to five minutes. That's a long time. Like the average set would go on for maybe what, 30, 45 seconds. Resting for then three up to five minutes between sets so you can repeat the performance that is a hell of a long time to rest. What are you doing in that time? Are you are you sitting there like a zen sort of zombie, just quietly sitting in the corner, really focusing on your next set and what you're doing? Or are you just pissing away time on the phone? Like, it, it doesn't match. What I'm saying is it doesn't match. Like, are you sitting there generating and focusing on, on that intensity? Or are you just like looking at memes on the internet? It's just pissing away time. So if you are just pissing away time, rather than resting a bit longer, why don't you just rest a little bit shorter, still a reasonable amount of time, two or three minutes, okay? And then in doing that, you could double or even triple the volume, which you do in your session, and make it harder, make it more useful. So I guess I don't, I don't get the answer which says, well, I'd just rather rest a lot longer and, and, and I can get more reps that way. It's like, well, what are you doing in that rest period? And, and how can you be so sure you are actually working hard in those sets? Oh, because I rest a long time. Well, how do you know? How do you know? And also, if you've stalled, if you've stalled out your, your gains, and again, how do you know? Um, if, you're, if you're sat there with a, you know, 100 kilo for eight squat, you're like, yeah, I work really hard. It's like, how do you fucking know? You don't know. So it's a big risk to say, yeah, I'm going to rest as long as I want between sets. But trust me, bro, I'm training hard enough. Just trust me, bro. I know I'm able to get eight, 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 eight. I'm able to get eight sets of eight with the same weight. But trust me, bro, the first five sets are really hard. You just wouldn't understand. You wouldn't understand, Faz. You don't know. So, <laughs> but I think, it's, I think it's quite a big um, risk. It's a gamble. It's a gamble. I, I want that feedback after the first set. On the second set, I want to know that I've worked hard enough because I have a performance drop-off. So this is what your sets should look like. This is what I consider to be a hard bunch of working sets. So let's say we squat for 165 for 13. 165 kilos for 13. That's a hard set. That is a true one or two reps in reserve. So your next or next after rep will be fail and you drop to the pins. 13 reps. And notice the 13 as well. Oftentimes when I see people's set listings and they're like 888 or 555, it's like, oh, for God's sake. Like you, you just, it's so, so scripted. You know they're just holding back. So it's 13, 16, 14. These tend to be numbers that when people just stop there, something's happened. Like 
<laughs> no one stops at a set of seven unless some shit's gone down, right? So 165 for 13, rest a sufficient amount of time, maybe two or three minutes, but they're so fatigued in their legs and back where they should be fatigued, they have to drop to eight and then five. And at that stage, they drop down to 130 to enable them to keep their reps high. That's what four hard sets should look like which is very different from the first example where it was eight, 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 and then six because they got bored and just tired. This is what hard sets look like, actually look like. Each individual set represents a very, very high level of stimulus. See, in that first example, the stimulus, it probably starts from about here, right? And then as the sets climb, so as the sets go on one, two, three, four, the fatigue kind of climbs slowly like this, right? With this approach, the fatigue starts right here and, and, the, and the stimulus starts right here and it carries on staying high all the way through. So again, those ramping sets, those first three sets in the previous example, we can't realistically say they were actually working sets. This is what working sets actually look like. So next up, there is one exception. Now, if you're using consistent reps as part of a rep scheme, um, or if, if you've been specifically told to use consistent reps. A very occasionally, I will do that as part of a sort of a lead-in block towards higher volumes. And then in later subsequent blocks, I'll have people doing more like, by example, there of hard sets. It just gets people used to the high volume workload. It's not a bad way of introducing people to higher volumes. So there is one exception, but I wouldn't say that's very many people. So in conclusion, this is all still part of quantifying intensity because and my argument all along has been until we have a consistent language we can use to communicate intensity, then these things are always going to be misunderstood. Volume is well defined now. Okay, Greg Knuckles did a lot of good work with that and he, we use that measure to define volume. Volume is the number of hard sets per week. Before that, we were using crazy things like tonnage, which just don't really make any sense in the context of bodybuilding. Frequency is also well defined by numbers of sessions per muscle per week, and neither of those really have a lot of ego attached. Intensity is the one that gets problems because, because the way we deal with the word intensity. And people just have a mental block on that. As soon as you tell them, or as soon as you suggest to them, they're not training as hard as they should be, pff, forget about it. It's like telling somebody who's miscounted their calories and isn't losing any weight, I think you're miscounting calories, you're probably eating more than you than you think you are. Like, oh, that's it. Like, that is just, you have put down the white flag, you are ready to go to war, and, and they will take that personally. So there are certain things, certain trigger points for a lot of people. Working hard is part and parcel of that. In the same way as with the diet, suggesting people have cheated on their diet, it just strikes to the heart of them. Like, <laughs> It's, it's, it's insane, like how, but these are, and so this is why we need to quantify these things and we need to give people an actual framework for understanding what they're doing. So if somebody watching this video has some sense about them and is actually thinking, actually, yeah, my reps look like that. I, I, I thought I was working hard. I am working hard. Who is Faz to suggest I'm not working hard? What the hell, Faz? But my sets look like, yeah, they, they do look like that. They look like eight, eight, eight. Yeah, wow. Maybe I'm not working as hard as I thought. Well, now you know. Now you have at least a window into viewing this material, all of it, everything that I put out to do with uh, intensity in a different light with a more open mind. And so you'll probably go back and watch some of the videos and some other resources on the internet from, from various other people and look at all that with a different light now. But I do really think ego gets in the way with this because, because people have such a strong visceral reaction to being told or suggested that they're not working as hard as they think they are. Um, and oftentimes it's, 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 it's because of that sort of ego attachment. There's a, there's a researcher out of um, England, Dr. Steele, who's coming up with better ways of quantifying intensity of effort. Uh, he told me this in the last interview I did with him, and it seems it sounds like very interesting stuff. But uh, I think it's a huge problem. Like we're very good at quantifying volume, we're very good at quantifying frequency, intensity not so much. But it does have a knock-on effect to volume and frequency, as we saw in the first example where the guy was doing eight, 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 six. 
possibly only one of those sets was actually a hard set or could contribute to the volume of the week. Conceivably, neither of them could. None of them could. Because by the by the fourth set, he might just be tired. He's a lot, lot of lactic acid build up. It might just be lots of substrates built up, a lot of big pump. He just can't get as many reps out. So he might just be tired. He might not have actually stimulated new growth. So what looks like four sets con you know, contributing to 16 sets that he's doing per week was actually zero. And that's a big problem. So it ha intensity is its own problem, but it creates problem for the rest of your program as well. Because you could well be doing a lot less than you think you're doing because volume is defined by hard sets. And if you're just pissing away time like that at the gym, then you're not doing the volume you think you are. Yeah, so it's a tough topic to talk about. It is. Um, but it's a very realistic problem that I think a lot of people have. And because of that, you can't just tell people work harder. You, you, you can't, it's obvious you can't just tell people, work harder, work harder, work harder. It, it, after a while, people need more guidance. And it, it's up to us, you know, coaches, content producers, to be responsible enough to, to provide that guidance and say, okay, these are things that we're looking for. And because this is stuff that I look for. I mean, I gave you the example of the calories, which is not to ramble too much, but in the same way, the calorie thing is, is, is obvious too. If I have a guy who for four weeks has not lost any weight, and he's telling me, I'm in a deficit every day, but like, oh, it must be water weight fads or it must be this. But for four weeks, he's gained weight or at least maintained weight. Like, bro, you are not in a deficit. Now, that is some of the hardest things to say to people. Obviously, I'm never going to be that blunt, but to a client anyway. But it's a very difficult thing to say to someone because they feel they're working hard. They feel they're on a diet, but they're actually not. And the, the the fortunate thing is the the amount of calories they need to bridge that gap or the effort they need to bridge that gap is usually quite small. Just eat two or 300 calories less. In the same way with training, just do three or four more reps per set. And then it's a case of how bad do you want it? Because you you can theorize this and science, you can science this stuff as much as you like, but you, bottom line, you've got to get in there and do it. Anyway, hope that was useful. Let me know what you thought and I will speak to you guys in the next one.